So uh, welcome to our uh, fall theory seminar. Delighted to have uh, Basiles Gazelles here to kick it off with um, presenting actually one of my favorite papers from EC this year. Uh, so uh, Basiles is got his PhD from NYU with Richard Cole and is now uh, working on a postdoc with Tim Rathgarden at Stanford. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about mechanism design for fair division, and more specifically about allocating divisible items without the use of payments. And this is joint work with my advisor Richard Cole and with Doug and Will from Google Research. Okay, so this falls into this general research agenda of incentive-centered design, where you get problem instances that involve the following things. A set of resources, that could be valuable goods, uh, food, time, etc. It can be anything. It's an abstract notion of a good. A set of agents, we, which can be humans or computer programs or anything like that that takes strategic choices. And our goal will be to allocate the resources among the agents in a desirable way. And that might mean efficient, that might mean fair. You choose your objective. Uh, the added obstacle that we're considering, though, also, is that the agents can or need to affect uh, the allocation outcome. And what do I mean by that? So here are some examples. For example, a divorce settlement. In this case, the agents are the two people, the couple. The resources are the shared goods, their common property. And the goal in this case would probably be to allocate in a fair way. Uh, the obstacle is that they need to affect the allocation outcome, right? We cannot just disregard their preferences. We need to know what they want in order to choose a fair outcome. Different example would be road traffic congestion control, and that would, uh, for example, involve the agents being the drivers, the resources being the streets. The goal would be probably efficiency, minimize uh, the delays, and the obstacle again is that they can This time they need, they, they can affect the allocation outcome. They can choose their own, their own path to work. Uh, and another one is peer-to-peer -peer networks again, shared resources. You choose whether to upload, download. All these uh, problems fall under the same uh, category. Okay, so what we are considering here, what we're trying to do is to bring the incentives to the center of the protocol design process. So we want to design a protocol that takes this input and chooses an allocation such that it maximizes some notion of efficiency or fairness while taking into consideration the incentives uh, of the participating agents. Okay. Okay, so one such protocol that many of you might be aware of is the following cake cutting protocol. There are two kids, you want to cut a cake, and you ask the first kid, you choose one of the two kids at random, you say the first one cuts the cake in two pieces that are of equal value to that specific kid, and then the other kid chooses the piece among these two that she prefers, and then the, the other kid, the first kid, receives what remains, the remaining piece. Okay, so that makes sense, right? It sounds fair. Is there a problem in terms of incentives, is my question. Would the first kid, no matter what he knows about the second kid, would the first kid always do exactly what the protocol asks? So that's, that's worth thinking about, just understand what I mean by incentives here. For example, if we just put a cherry on top of the cake, so there's a cherry now, is it still, is it easy? Is it, like, do you think the player one would possibly under some circumstances want to avoid following the protocol? Okay, so if player one knows that player two really likes the cherry, whereas player one doesn't really care about the cherry, he will not cut like equal pieces. He can just cut around the cherry knowing that the second bidder, the second player will just pick up the cherry so he can be strategic in game one. Okay, so that hopefully gives you an understanding of what I mean by being strategic. You shouldn't follow the protocol. You can be smarter if he knows more. So that's the kind of thing we want to avoid here. We don't want to give the participants the incentive to be smart or strategic in order to gain more. We want to relieve them from that whole way of thinking. So we want to design allocation mechanisms despite self-interested agents. And the most flexible tool that has been used in mechanism design for this kind of thing is monetary payments that reward or penalize the players so that they behave according to what we want. So to make sure, like VCG is something you might know. All of these mechanisms choose a notion of uh, an amount of payment for each different outcome that achieves uh, this 
behavior that we wish. But the payments are often prohibited, and this is common for ethical, legal, practical considerations, and so on. For example, when uh, groups within a company like Google are sharing uh, computational resources, you cannot really elicit payments or pay the participating groups. You just want to make sure they usefully, like they efficiently use the computational resources, but you cannot really pay them since they're within the company. It's not actual money that you can use. Or again, when you're trying to be fair, for fair division, money shouldn't be the, the dis shouldn't cause a distinction between two uh, players. It should be, they should be treated equally, should, so money shouldn't be uh, an issue here. So that's exactly what we're focusing on in this talk, is that we cannot use money. So we're using mechanism design without money, where, and we're, we're following a centralized mechanism design approach, where we have a mediator who collects the valuations, the preferences of the players, and this is private information. Like before, we're assuming that the mechanism doesn't know this information, doesn't know what the preferences are, and then chooses an allocation, right? And unlike standard mechanism design, there are no payments. So usually the second step says, choose an allocation and a payment rule, but now there are no payments. So it's only the allocation. And there are some questions that arise when you're not using <coughs> payments. For example, your valuations, how much you value each one of the items is now kind of a strange notion because there's no measure. Usually you use money as a measure You're saying how much are you willing to pay for this good and that translates to your valuation for it. Now we don't have that uh, option and therefore we need solutions and allocations ru allocation rules that are scale free meaning if you multiply your values by some constant it shouldn't change the outcome. So you're not, otherwise you would just say infinity or something like really really big numbers and that doesn't make sense. We don't want that. And how can we really affect the incentives now? So all we really were really left with is keeping some resources unallocated or degrading the performance of the system, essentially delaying users. If it's the streets, you might introduce traffic lights. You have to somehow introduce inefficiencies just to change the incentives so, since we don't have payments. So that's uh, something that has been referred to as money burning by Hardline and Rough Garden. So money burning is what we need to do. So essentially, we will have to uh, lose the Pareto efficiency aspect of it. We have to lose some efficiency in order to bring good incentives, and we're trying to lever. Like, trade, there's a trade-off between the two, so we're trying to make sure we are always going to achieve strategy proofness, truthfulness. Everybody says the truth about their valuations, and at the same time achieve some approximation of the objective. So, so we have some objectives that we try to optimize. Okay, so formally, we have a setting where we have m divisible items. So you can divide them to small pieces, and they're going to be indexed by k, and a set of n bidders that are going to be indexed by i and j. Okay? And an allocation x is defining that bidder i receives a portion x i k of item k. Right? For any i and any k, it gives us a fraction of that item that uh, bidder i receives. Make sense? And for every item k, of course, we know that this has to hold that the fraction has to be positive. This is just the natural physical constraints. And that for every item, the sum over all players of these fractions is at most one. You don't over allocate an item. Okay? <coughs> so these are just the natural physical constraints. And for now, let's assume that the bitter valuations are additive. Okay, so every bitter will give us a value for each one of the goods. And what is true is that if it tells us a value about item A and a value for item B, then the value, if he gets both, is the sum of A and B. Okay, that's a natural thing to do. We're going to remove this assumption later on. But, uh, and the same applies for fractions. If you get half an item, you get half its value. So this is the formula that gives you uh, the, the additive linear variations. Sounds good so far? Okay. So using this model, we want to design strategy proof or truthful mechanisms where no matter what happens, no matter what the specific instance at hand is, the best strategy of every bidder is to always report the true valuations. In other words, we don't know what the VIKs are. For any given thing, we don't know what the value for each item is, but we design the mechanism in a way such that it is to their best interest, no matter what uh, is the case, that they will report the true values. And that's the main restraint and the hard constraint here. And we want to design a mechanism that, as input, receives these values for every i and every k, the value v i k, 
and outputs an allocation for every i and every k and x i. Okay, so that's exactly the, the setting that we're going to repeat throughout this uh, talk, but we'll consider different uh, objectives. At first, I'm going to start with an efficiency objective, and then I'm going to uh, present the main result, which is unfairness. Okay, so what does efficiency mean in a setting without money? That's kind of a difficult question, because usually you maximize social welfare means some of the valuations. But now, since we don't have a scale, it's not obvious what this means. So one objective uh, about efficiency that has been studied in the past is one that first scales the valuations so that they add up to one. So no matter what you give me, I will scale it down so everybody's valuations are scaled so that they add up to one. So it's the relative values that I really care about. And then I try to my, so in this case, let's say we have two bidders. So let's restrict ourselves to two bidders for this objective. So bidder one has this set of bids. You can verify they sum up to one. And bidder two has these uh, bids. And these are the items in blue circles. And the question is, uh, what does efficiency mean? So one that has been studied is this. So maximize these, the sum of these scaled valuations. Allocate these items in a way that maximizes the sum of the valuations that have been scaled so that they add up to one. Uh, and we will use uh, x bar to denote the maximum, the, the allocation that maximizes this object. Okay? And my question here is, is that easy to compute for these two bidders? Just to get you going, like to start you thinking about with the, this, uh, this problem. Would you, would you think it's easy to do that? How would you allocate the items to maximize this? That's actually very easy. Okay, so you always give the item to the bidder who reported the highest bid. So essentially, you would draw a line somewhere here, and everything to the left would be to bidder one, everything to the right, bidder two. Okay, so it's easy. Why not just do that, right? So the mechanism can just receive the input, output that. Would that be truthful? So the problem here, if you think about it, is it wouldn't be because why would bidder two bid so high on an item he's not going to receive? So he can instead move this point 0.1 bid over here, which would give him point 0.15, which would earn him the fourth item, but the first he wasn't receiving it anyway. And the general way to say that, you don't want to underbid, you don't want to bid on something you're not going to receive, and you don't want to overbid while you're still receiving an item. So there's a lot of strategic behavior you can have. You want to just slightly overbid <coughs> the other way, right, for the items you like the most. So obviously you cannot just say, it's easy to compute, let the mechanism just do that, and everything will be fine. There will be a problem here. So you have to face this problem. That's what uh, we need to do. And one attempt to do that, this, this uh, objective was considered by Guo and Konitzer, uh, where they considered the uh, goal of designing truthful mechanisms, which output an allocation x, such that for all the inputs, so in the worst case sense, no matter what happens, no matter what the instance at hand is, the social welfare of the allocation is at least some function rho of the of some some number rho, some approximation factor rho of the optimal social welfare. Right? And of course you want to try to maximize rho. Okay? So you want to make sure that rho is as, as big as possible, which guarantees you that you're close enough to the as close as possible to the optimal social welfare. And there there were a sequence of mechanisms that were proposed, but none of them did better than half approximation. And actually, there was a result by Han et al., uh, which showed that there is actually no dictatorial truthful to bitter mechanism that achieves better than half. So it's a large natural class of truthful mechanisms that cannot break this bound. It's half is the best that anyone can do within this class. And I, again, argue that this is easy. Half <coughs> is trivial. Can you see why half is trivial? You don't really need to be smart about it. You can do the following thing, the following dictatorial mechanism. Cut everything in half. Remember, the items are divisible, right? Give one half to one bidder, the other half to the other. Social welfare you achieve is a half approximation. <coughs> right? Even in the worst case. So, no, it's, it's, it's going, yes. So, uh, so, therefore, we want something better than that, right? But the people didn't, there was an open question, can anyone design something which is not dictatorial? Because in many cases, we know that Dictatorial is all that you can do if you are, uh, if you need strategy proofness. So dictatorial mechanisms seem to be the, the main way to go. Uh, but uh, what we show, so the first result that I'm going to show is that we propose a mechanism that guarantees two-thirds of automation, actually breaks its bound, but of course not being dictatorial. 
And what I think is interesting is the way in which this mechanism is now picked up. So I'm going to present this mechanism, and then I'm going to generalize it. So here it's for just two bidders. Uh, I'm going to generalize it later on for many bidders. Before I get there, though, I need this intermediate, uh, this notion that I'm going to use on it as an intermediate step, which is the notion of proportional fairness. And hopefully you know what Pareto efficiency is. So an allocation X is Pareto efficient if for all other allocations X prime, if there exists a player I who prefers X prime to X, then there must exist some other player J who uh, strictly prefers uh, X to X prime, right? So. It cannot be the case that x prime is preferred by both, by, by everyone, right? In, in which case, x prime would be just strictly better. So, in this case, if you can verify that I have ordered the <coughs> items so that they're in a non-increasing order of the v1 over v2 ratio, okay? So I just divide the bidders, the bidder 1 over bidder 2, and I, I'm asking now what is a Pareto efficient solution here, and you visualize what a Pareto efficient looks like. A Pareto efficient solution looks like. It's actually a very clear characterization in this very specific case. So Pareto efficiency in this case, having ordered the items in this fashion, is going to be a line saying everything to the right of this line is goes to bitter two, everything to the left of this line goes to bitter one. And that's an if and only if. All Pareto efficient allocations will be such lines in this Okay, you can verify that if this is not the case, you can actually trade things across the line, and at least one uh, will strictly improve without hurting the other. So, proportional fairness is actually a refinement of this notion. So, it's an allocation x, uh, which, for if for all, it's uh, so x is proportionally fair. If for all other allocations x prime, this holds, and you can verify that. This implies Pareto efficiency, right? Because if there's anything that is positive in the numerator, the denominator is always positive. So if there's anything positive in the numerator, there has to be something negative. But it's a refinement of that. Essentially what this is saying is that the items have to be allocated to the person. So for every i, this is the marginal increase or decrease in the valuation that player i experiences when moving from x to x prime. So what this says is a refinement saying I don't just care about this uh, as this restriction, I care about something more, which is I want to make sure that there's no way to move to change an allocation so that the aggregate increase uh, is greater than the aggregate decrease, or uh, the relative aggregate relative increase versus the aggregate relative decrease. Okay, and I'm going to use so this is an important notion. I'm going to get back to this later on, so this is important to remember. And it has many nice properties that I'm going to mention later on. But what it is, is a very specific, so I mentioned a refinement of Pareto efficiency. In this case, it's exactly that, which defines unique bitter valuations. It's a unique point in this line, where essentially if I push the line to the right, the relative decrease of one, uh, the relative increase of bitter one uh, is uh, smaller than the relative decrease of bitter two. Okay, hopefully you understand. This is an important point, that's why I'm spending so much time here. So this is an intermediate point that defines unique valuation. In this case, it's 0.75 and 0.7. And I'm going to use this point in order to uh, design uh, the mechanism. And here's the first mechanism that I want to talk about. And the, the next one will be a generalization of this. This is for two bidders, and we do the following. First step is compute the proportionally fair solution, the, the, the one I just mentioned before which yields these unique bitter valuations, which is what I mentioned before. So in this case, it would be just fine. This is just n log n time, right? You just sort the items and go through each and every one of them to find this one. It's not hard to find. And you get these uh, values, v1 and v2, okay? And then bitter one gets a fraction, rather than getting all of these items, I only give him a fraction v2 of that allocation. So what fraction bitter one gets depends on how happy bitter 2 is, and vice versa. So bitter 2 gets a fraction v1 of her PF allocation. So that's what's kind of non-standard here, that clearly this is not dictatorial. What I get very much depends on how happy the other person is. And the idea, and this I'm going to show later on, is truthful. And what this means is if bitter 1 lies, and he may as well lie and push the line to the right, 
that say he could do that. By doing that, he gets a bigger bundle, but he hurts bitter too, therefore he gets a smaller fraction of that bigger bundle. If, on the other hand, he pulls this line, he gets a smaller bundle and a bigger fraction of it, but somehow it perfectly balances off, he needs to say the truth. Okay? So I'm going to argue and simply show you how this is actually truthful, but this is the mechanism. And for this objective that we have uh, been considering so far, the social welfare of this mechanism is actually very high when the players have disjoint interests. So when one player just likes this half and the other likes that half and they don't like the same things, both of them will be having the PF solution, both of them will get all of their PF solution. So actually you get perfect approximation of the efficiency. But on the other hand, unfortunately, when bidders have exactly, for example, the same valuations, they both get half valuation, so they both get half of their proportional fair solution. So it performs really well when they have disjoint interests, really bad when they have the same interests. So, and that other half is thrown away. Yes, that's that's the problem, exactly. So you compute that, and since both of, both of their valuations are half, they all get half of what they were supposed to get here. So they get a small fraction, that's the, the bad thing. Both of them are somewhat unhappy. Um, okay, so this doesn't improve on the simple mechanism I showed before. That's also a half approximation, so I'm not offering something good here, but here's a mechanism <coughs> that does give the two-thirds approximation. First step is run the dictatorial mechanism that I mentioned before, that every item in half give each player one half of each item. Second step is run the partial allocation mechanism, which is what I described in the previous slide, Third step is output the best allocation between the two. And here's what you should be thinking by now. This doesn't make much sense. You cannot really do that and maintain truthfulness. You cannot just say, here's a mechanism that's truthful. Here's a mechanism that's truthful. Take the max. It's not even well defined in most cases what the max is. But you can do it here. And the reason is that both these mechanisms are equitable, which means that both players receive exactly the same valuation in every outcome. For example, in the dictatorial mechanism, they both get a value of half. They like everything one, they get half of it, they get a value of half, both. In the other one, bitter one gets a fraction V2 of his V1 value, so it's V1 times V2. Bitter two gets a fraction V1 of his V2 value. Both of them get V1 times V2. So actually, the nice thing is, without even asking them what their preferences are, you know, in advance, that they agree on what is the best between the two mechanisms. So you can actually get this, which is which is nice because if if you remember the if you think about the dictatorial mechanism, it actually doesn't perform well when the players have this joint this disjoint interest because you're throwing away half which they didn't really they, you're giving them half which they don't really want, and it's performing really well when they have the same interests. So conveniently, here's what you get. So you use the so as a function of the optimal social welfare, you get uh, to use the dictatorial one for the first half of the way, and then you can use the, the other one picks up. None of them, so both of them go to a half, but you can use a max of them, which takes you to two thirds. Okay, so that's so essentially that's the first objective we're considering. This is just a way, a trick to use one can use for two bidders to get a two thirds approximation where. No mechanism was known. Uh, but from now on, I'm going to switch the objective and just to clarify the distinction between the two, I'm going to stop briefly here to see if you have any questions on this part. Yes? How do you improve in this case? How do you find something better for the case of two ages? That's the best known. The best so known previously was a half. You have you found what the example, the example, the example where you have the two-third opportunity? Yes, it's like. It's like with respect yeah. to these, but can you find something else for that particular example? Of so you're saying if there is a proof that there's no truthful mechanism that does better than two thirds? Uh, not necessarily. I can assume that since you combine two mechanisms, you could potentially find another one that's possibly cutting. The so idea. we know that for two bidders, even for just two items, you cannot do better than something like 1.81, even for two items and two bidders. There's no truthful mechanism. But I think nothing else in between is known. So you could possibly, I'm, I'm not arguing you can, this is the best known. This is significantly more than the best known, but the previous is best known. What I'm, what I'm arguing is that there is a particular area where you exactly know what would where your mechanism is performing badly. Since you can, can you come up with a third mechanism? Which is also like, which, which is equitable, but... So, uh, 
but I don't know of one, but yeah, yeah. possibly you could. I have, I don't have you no think proof it's... that. Uh, so equitable mechanisms are kind of rare in some sense that you would get exactly the same uh, value. So these are quite strange, both of them, in, the sense, in that sense. So I don't know that that, that many you can come up with that many equitable mechanisms. So you would probably need. Uh, so I, I don't think so, but I don't have a very solid argument against it. Yes. For the proportional allocation, does some of the allocation get allocated to either of the two? So it's, yes. So essentially, we have to throw away or just keep some of the cake. Or could the you cake. could you add in just like randomize who give the, the extra? The incentives here? change. Okay. If you know that at the end of the day you're going to with some probability receive something, then you're uh, you're going to. Okay, so there's no way to try to get that. In. Again, I don't know that there's no way, but right. uh, so I've tried. For example, I will show you later on that this the generalization of this mechanism has a nice, very nice connection with VCG. You can interpret it as VCG in a different dimension. And therefore, in case some of you are aware of, uh, uh, th there, there are some <coughs> mechanisms that try to get the truthfulness out of the structure of BCG, but get some of the revenue back, right? So you can apply some of these ideas, but it doesn't change the worst case pattern so far. I haven't seen anything that. So you can reallocate some of these things, just like you do by returning payments from BCG, but by redistribution mechanisms. But uh, I don't know that something that improves the problem. So that's, that's another Is it, um, is it possible? So they can't, you can't increase the value of what you're allocated by kind of blaming the other persons because then they're going to get to pay less, which is going to decrease your probability. But is it possible for them to come to some kind of equilibrium that maybe, that maybe they can both calculate where, you know, I carved out what I understand I'm going to get and you carve out what you are going to get and then... So you're saying whether they can collaborate and get better... Collaborate models. so that they both do better. Or... So presumably they could, by, by lying, they could lie, but then it's a matter of what the equilibrium, if one lies, maybe the other has the, so I'm not sure it would be an equilibrium. They can both, there is an outcome where they both lie and they are both there. Their, their probabilities of getting paid off on the bundles of their So, their so first of all, there, there are no uh, probabilities here. Since we have divisible items, there's no need for probabilities. You have uh, fractions of items correspond to exactly probabilistic, for additive valuations. But uh, I, Obviously, for this mechanism, you can both lie about things you're not going to get and both be better off, but that's not going to be an equilibrium in general. Because once one says he doesn't care about uh, your, your outcome, you can push further and get more, right? So that's, that's what it's not going to be an equilibrium. You can both lie and be better off, but it's not going to be an equilibrium. It's not obvious. Okay. So at this point, I'm won't consider efficiency anymore. That's all you'll see about this notion of efficiency. I'm going to talk about fairness and an objective which I think is much, much more interesting. And I'm going to also remove the two-bitter assumption and have arbitrary number three. And when I talk about fairness, this is already a very interesting question because fairness is not that well defined. It can be many different things. What does fairness mean? Uh, and there are many different of me measures of fairness that have been considered in the past. Uh, one is envy freeness, which asks that no players at the end of the day envies another player's allocation. Having allocated everything, I don't envy the other player's allocation. The other one is proportionality, which since we have n bidders, we're asking that every one of them receives a fraction, one of, at least one over n of this whole value. Right? So that sounds also fair. You get, at least if you're free, there are three of you, you think out of all the value that was there, you got a third. So that's called proportionality. And both of these have been studied a lot in the past. Uh, what we are going to consider is this notion I mentioned before as an intermediate step. Now I'm going to use it as an objective, that this is what we should be getting. And as I mentioned, uh, this, uh, this is actually being, uh, having, uh, this has been implemented in practice for bandwidth allocation very widely uh, in uh, networks. And it asks that, uh, each bidder, uh, each piece of the goods is allocated to the bidder who experiences the highest relative increase, as we explained before by looking at the formula. And another good property is it satisfies both fairness notions defined above, so it's both envy free and proportional, uh, but it has even more uh, good properties. And what I like about it is it actually lies between utilitarian and egalitarian social welfare. So in case you don't know what this is, egalitarian means I'm going to try to help the least happy person become happier. 
I just care about the minimum, and I'm doing max min, right? So there are also a notion of uh, there are also an objective, in which case you just care about it, and that might make things inefficient because that person might be hard to satisfy, right? So it might make things inefficient. And the other extreme is just looking at efficiency. The utilitarian social welfare is just maximizing the sum of the valuations, like we did before, which is essentially just looking at efficiency, but might hurt one person significantly, so that wouldn't be really fair. And this nicely falls between these two uh, notions, so it balances both. It tries to be efficient, but not uh, doesn't hurt anyone too much. And another way to think about it, which might motivate you more, is uh, for the same we consider here, it's equivalent to the competitive equilibrium from equal incomes, which is saying the following. I will allocate each and every one of you one dollar of paper money, monopoly money, which have no value outside the mechanism at hand, and I will compute the market equilibrium. So obviously that sounds fair, right? Because everybody has the exact same buying power and I compute prices that clear the market and everybody gets whatever they could with that same money. And that has been argued to be like for divisible items and fair division that this is the best uh, thing one could hope for. So that's, that's actually been argued to be the right solution that one should hope for. But what is the negative thing about it? Oh, before I go there, in order to compute this, you can solve this problem. So given these feasibility constraints that I mentioned before, the objective you need to care about is the sum of the logs of the valuations. So what the solution does is it maximizes the sum of the logs. Or equivalently, it maximizes the product of the valuations. Which is, if you take a log of this objective, you get the other one. So since log is increasing, they're equivalent objective. So keep that in mind, that this is the way to get the solution. And Hopefully I've convinced you that this is, I mean, the right thing, and that is the holy grail for fairness in divisible items. The problem with it, which has been mentioned several times, is that it cannot be implemented truly. So just like the social welfare optimizing solution I, I showed you before, you cannot just say, here's the proportionate resolution, I computed it, and that's it. And here's, uh, here's the outcome. People will lie for the same, the exact same reasons. They will underbid for things they're not getting, and, and so on. Uh, so the good thing about it, though, so we'll have to settle for some notion of approximation again, just like before. We'll have to try to approximate that solution. And here's, I think, the more interesting part of the talk begins, because the good thing about the solution is that it defines unique bidder valuations, right? So it has a benchmark. Essentially, it says here's what you should be receiving. <laughs> Here's your fair share. It defines unique fair shares of value for each and every one of them, right? And we don't need to scale anymore. It's scale free on its own. So we don't need to scale the bids. Everybody can give any values that they want. It still makes, makes sense. It, it doesn't depend on the scale. So the good thing, since we're talking about approximation, is that we can use this as a benchmark. We can use these valuations as what we wish we could achieve. And the question now is, what is the right notion of approximation? We're trying to shoot for uh, fairness. So what should we try to do here? How should we approximate that solution? Okay, so think about it for a bit. We have, for each and every one of the players, we have a value that corresponds to the value they should be receiving. And we try to fold, so it's a high dimensional point for every, so for n bidders, you have n values, and you try to approximate this. What's the right notion of approximation? Well, right, what would you choose? What's an interesting notion of approximation? So one which I think uh, is, I mean, the hardest one I believe to, to get is the following. If, since we're, uh, we're going uh, to uh, want fairness, we want to guarantee every bidder a good fraction of that share. Each and every one of the bidders. So the approximation factor is the minimum across all bidders of the value the bidder gets over the value he should be getting. So essentially what I'm saying in this high dimensional point, I want to approximate it for each and every one of the parameters. And I'll take the max min over these ratios. Does this make sense? So you need to understand this before I, I show how to approximate it. So in a truthful way, approximate this. So just to summarize our goal again, now we relax the additive valuations and we go to homogeneous valuations which is much more general. In, in other words, now I'm not, all I'm asking is that if there's a bundle x, for, uh, you get a fraction f of it, f is a scalar, then your value is f the value of the whole bundle. So if you have a bundle, you get a fraction of it, you get a fraction of the value. Or saying things spoken differently is that I'm not anymore assuming additive across items, your value for a and your value for b 
is something, but your value for a and b doesn't need to be the sum. It can be something more general than that. What I am restricting you to is linearity within fractions. That if you get half of it, though, you get half of the value, or a third of it. And this is much, much more general. Many natural uh, valuation functions that have been studied fall under this category. For example, constant elasticity of substitution, the T evaluations, the additive that we saw before, and many more. And so now we are assuming much, much less about what the bidder's valuations look like. And we want to design a mechanism that first elicits these true valuations, and then computes an allocation X of the divisible items, and we measure the fairness of the outcome X using proportional fairness as a benchmark. So, and this strong notion of approximation, again, the minimum across all players of the value they receive in this mechanism, the truthful mechanism, compared to what they should be getting in proportional fair solution. Okay? And here's how we get this. I'm reminding you here the previous mechanism. We are computing an allocation which yields these valuations. Bitter I gets, bitter one gets a fraction B2, bitter two gets a fraction B1. How do we generalize this to more bidders, though? That's, that's non-trivial. For example, here I told you talked about part efficiency and that being a very nicely characterized line between there's no such thing anymore, right? When you have more than two bidders, that goes out the window. That there's no easy way to visualize part efficiency or to order anything. There are many different frontiers among the allocations and it's hard to even imagine. So that's out the window. And also the valuations are much, much more difficult to visualize. So how do we achieve a generalization of this mechanism to work for an arbitrary number of bidders. And this is the, the main slide being the answer to this question. So we start with the same step. We compute the proportionally fair allocation, including all the bidders. Okay? And the second step is that for each bidder i, we compute the proportionally fair solution, xpf minus i, that would arise if we removed bitter i and computed that same outcome. Right? So we, if we remove bitter i and computed the proportionally fair solution if that layer was not there. So, so far in these two steps, we have compu computed n plus 1 uh, equilibria, better equilibria. And the interesting step is the last one, which says that bitter i is allocated an fi fraction offer proportionally fair uh, location, just like before. And fi is this ratio over there. So remember there before, okay, so in the previous case, just think about this for two bidders. The denominator is what? For two bidders. One, right? If I remove one bidder, the other one gets everything, so it's one, and the numerator is v1 or v2, depending on q. So it's exactly the same mechanism. And this, the reason why it works is similar. It's that if bitter i lies and tries to get a bigger bundle, it's hurting other people. And in effect, this drops. The product of the valuations of everyone else drops. So again, if he lies and gets a bigger bundle, he will get a smaller fraction of that bigger bundle. OK? Um, by, but I mean, still, why is it truthful? Can you think about why this makes sense? Why, this, why is this thing truthful? So the best thing you can do, you get this obscure fraction of your proportionally fair solution, and somehow it's the best you can do. You will always be honest. In hindsight, the answer is actually simple. So the valuation of each player, all I assumed is homogeneity. Homogeneous of degree one. So that means that for the fraction you got, your value is, if you, since you got an fi fraction of the proportional fair solution, your value is fi times this value, right? And if I replace fi over here, I get the same fraction, but note that here we have j including i, so for all j, not j other than i. So here I had the product of everyone's valuations, excluding i, I don't know if you can see this actually. So the numerator is a product of everyone's valuations, except i in the pf solution where everyone's there. And here I have the product of everyone else's valuation except i when he's not there. And here I'm adding the i. So here the numerator is a product of everyone's valuations. So remember, what was the objective that the proportionally fair solution was maximizing? It's exactly that, right? So the proportionally fair solution is actually maximizing the product of the valuations. And the denominator doesn't depend on your bid. So it is to your best interest in order to maximize the numerator, which is the only thing you can affect, to tell the truth so that the actual solution is maximized. 
And I guess if, so the ones of, uh, among you that know VCG see the connection already, that in some sense you have an objective which is being maximized exactly where you wanted it to be, and you have these externalities which are scaling how much you're going to get and so on. And the connection, again in hindsight, is much stronger, it's, it's not just that. You can have the following translation. So instead of looking, thinking about utilities, the VIs, the evaluations, think about these surrogate valuations. Instead of the VI, think about the UI, which is the log of that, right? So if you want to maximize the VI, you want to maximize the UI, same thing. Since UI is just the log of VI. So everybody wants to maximize their UIs now. So I've changed the domain. And just take a log of this line. What does that give you? It gives you the log <coughs> of this valuation is the sum of the logs in the numerator minus the sum of the logs in the denominator. And if I, again I replace with the UIs, what I get is this. So your utility, your, your surrogate valuation in the in this outcome of the mechanism is your sur surrogate valuation in XPF minus your externalities with respect to these surrogate valuations uh, compared to XPF. And again, all you need to remember is that XPF maximizes the sum of the logs, which is the social welfare with respect to the UIs. So it's doing exactly what VCG does in a different space. It's maximizing the social welfare, and everybody pays their VCG payment. Because it's exactly in this different space, the fraction I removed corresponds to a payment which in this different space corresponds to subtracting exactly this amount. Okay? Any questions on this? So this is, this is the connection with VCG. So this is a way essentially to apply VCG without using money. But just assuming homogeneity, which is not such a strong assumption, and using removing fractions, uh, which you can do, uh, which in the log space implies subtraction. subtraction. Okay, so that's one thing, but I haven't shown you that this is in any case, it's true. Okay, so that's one step. I haven't in any way convinced you that this is good in the strong motion of approximation that I defined. Uh, okay, so in terms of approximation, remember approximation factor is this, right? The minimum overall value of the VI, which is nothing more than a minimum of overall eyes of the FI, that fraction I'm giving everyone, right? So I want to make sure nobody gets a small fraction. That's all, uh, that's the equivalent thing. These are exactly the same thing. So the fraction I'm going to be getting of my value is going to be, since we have homogeneity of degree one, is going to be the FI. Okay, so this is what we want to lower bound. We want to show that this is not going to be very small. And this is the point where I actually spent quite some time when I was working on this problem to show that this is going to be very, very, very small. You know, that it, uh, it is a function of the number of players or the number of items that somehow it shrinks. You cannot guarantee a good fraction when you have arbitrary numbers, arbitrary number of players. That it shrinks as a function of, of the parameters of it. Uh, but here's why this is not the case. Uh, so let D sub J be that relative change of player uh, J. So fix some player I, okay? So let's say the minimum is player I. The, the one who experiences a minimum fraction is player I. So for any player J other than I, we define this, right? Which is the relative difference that the player experiences moving from XPF to XPF without I, right? That's just a definition which means I can, just rewriting this, doing nothing smart so far, I get this, right? So I can express the, XP, the valuation here as the relative increase, one plus dj of that. Okay, nothing smart so far. And once again, doing nothing smart again, I will replace in the denominator. Okay, so I will replace the dj's, these dj's over there, which gives me what? This, right? So the fi, can rewrite it, as this value. So 1 over the product of these 1 plus dj. The dj's are simplified from the numerator. Okay? So can you think of this? So why would this not be small? That's the last of it. I'm not going to have much math after that. It's a couple of slides and I'm done. So I think it's worthwhile thinking about this a bit. Why is this not going to be small? So by definition of proportional fairness, remember I told you that this is true, 
right? So the sum of these dJs over all players is, a, is not bigger than zero, right? So if I, and I know that for player i, this will be one, right? Because he gets nothing in, in another case, right? So he, he loses everything. It's going to be minus one, sorry. Right? And therefore, if we remove player i and take it to the other side, we get this. The sum of the j's of j other than i is at most 1. OK? Just by removing i from the sum, because he has minus 1, taking it to the other side. So now, looking at these two, can you see why this is not going to be small? So we have a product of 1 plus dj's. And we know the sum of these dj's is bounded by a constant, by 1. So the guess is where do you, so sometimes you, you can imagine when is this going to be uh, the worst case? What's the worst case over the dj values for this in order to minimize this? It's actually when they're equal. And all the dj's are exactly equal. That's when this is minimized, this product. So the product is minimized when all, all of them are equal. It's maximized, sorry, but it's in the denominator. So if they're all equal, what we get is that this is 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 to the minus n minus 1, which is at least 1 over 8 in the limit. OK, so the worst case, essentially, just to explain this result, is if each and every one of the players, when I remove the i, get exactly the same fractional increase, that's exactly the worst case. But still, the, the denominator here wouldn't increase by that much. It would increase by a factor of 1 over 8 which means that each and every one of the players with this mechanism gets a constant, more than a third fraction of their value, no matter what the number of items, no matter what the number of bidders. Okay. And, okay, so let me summarize the main result. And this is uh, the last slide. Uh, so we have an arbitrary number of bidders and an arbitrary number of items divisible items. And also, we, so I'm going to remove some of the restrictions here. We, cannot, we don't need them to have the exact same uh, priority. We can also predefine some priority, say I care about this bidder more than the other one. I can give him different budgets. Still no, no change in the approximation factor. I can change the, the, the mechanism appropriately and I get exactly the same approximation factor in truthfulness. So I can also change the priorities, the budgets in the competitive equilibrium, let's say. And I get homogeneous variations of degree one. And I'm going to relax this too. I don't really need that. I can get any valuation function, which is an increasing function of f. So essentially, as long as I know gf, g of f, and it's an increasing function, I'm fine. So that's much more. So any degree, not only homogeneous. So I don't need to assume linearity. I can be quadratic, can be anything, as long as I know what it is. Uh, so that also can be relaxed. And still, we get that the partial allocation mechanism guarantees that over all players, the minimum over all i of this uh, ratio is going to be at least one rate, which is approximately 368. And that's the worst case instance that can ever happen. Uh, and to complement this result, we show that actually there is also no truthful mechanism, even, and this is for this very general setting, right? And here I'm saying that even if you restrict yourself to added evaluations and same budgets, Still, you cannot do better than half. So it's almost optimal. So there's there's a small gap between these two, but it's it's uh, haven't really tried to optimize. It. Maybe it's even uh, easy to close it. I would probably think that this is going to be improved rather than this. I cannot think of a different mechanism that just falls into place. I did try uh, VCG redistribution mechanisms. In some sense, as you asked, these things that were being thrown away and to try to bring them back in and distribute it, but it doesn't change the worst case, just like VCG redistribution. It doesn't change the uh, worst case instance. And, yeah. thank you. So in general, for non-divisible goods, you can think about probability distributions, right? So again, this makes them divisible. Then, uh, and you can play over, like if, if for the additive linear case, additive valuations you just have, it's essentially giving fractions, it's like giving probabilities. Yeah. So the only problem, so I thought about many of those cases where you have like uh, 
indivisible goods and you want to allocate like uh, students to uh, rooms or things like that. But that, the problem is there's a positive problem, you get nothing, which is the negative part of it. So that, that's, that's the main problem there, that there has to be, money burning means there has to be a positive problem that you get nothing in yeah. this, in this setting. Which, but still some results sure, sure, yeah, but that the, the probability distribution still kind of works mm -hmm. if you think about the fractions of probabilities. So there are two mechanisms people talk about, for instance, for like house allocation, I think. The probabilistic serial yes. and the random serial dictatorship. Yeah. How does this approach so it's a different those so, first of all, these ones are not assuming uh, cardinal preferences. They're assuming ordinal preferences. Uh, so you order your preference, just go over uh, the line. So it's not approximating the same solution. It's not even trying to get this notion of fairness. Usually it's one to, like one player, one item, it's a matching kind of setting, which is another issue. So it's, uh, it's somewhat different. It's not directly comparable. Like in, in this setting, if you tried this out, it wouldn't, it, wouldn't aim for the same object. I haven't tried to see exactly what they have given, so, but I don't think... So you couldn't apply your approach to the housing allocation? Oh, you're saying... So we could... Uh, so one thing is what I mentioned is that there's a positive probability you get no house, right? Since we're discarding fractions. Right. And, so that's the main problem I, I see in that. But other than that, uh, yeah, you could... Uh, yeah, it's, the matter is then in a way to implement the probability distributions. Like you don't want to get two houses maybe, because maybe you get That's some problem. Not a problem either, because it's a... Uh... Yeah, so other than that, no, I don't see a, a problem with that. It's mostly, I think the most, the reason why I didn't look into it too much is because exactly it's not acceptable really in some cases like that, that you get nothing with some probability. In some at least of the motivating instances. What about if you will allow combinatorial preferences? In other words, bundles. Uh, oh, but that is already assumed. Homogeneity doesn't assume anything yeah, across okay, bundles. It doesn't do anything. So yeah, so it, it works with the combinatorial evaluations. Yes, yeah, so as long as the equilibrium, like all these things exist, you can still like. Uh, I'm just assuming something within fractional allocations. I'm not assuming anything about the. In the, like integral allocations. <laughs> integral allocations can have any valuation. It's a matter of how you extend it into fractions that is restricted here. Other questions? All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.